Hello everybody, my name is Farmer Phil and today we are going to be taking a look at the handout that I had during the farm walk for those of you that weren't there and that want to see it and for those of you that were there that didn't get to see it as I didn't have enough leaf handouts so I had 50 handouts and as I said before we have between 70 to 80 people at it so we're going to run through that but just before I start into that just we're back in stock with beanies so we were out of stock with beanies for a while so we're back in stock with beanies we are literally just after putting up the Christmas tree literally and just on another note Bertie as you can see there there's not a loss on him I was asked about him or asked how was he and an update on him in one of the previous videos and I'd forgot to do in the last one or two anyways but there's not a loss on him so anyways, I think that's everything I needed to cover, so we're going to get into the handout now. So now, we look at the first page of the handout that I handed out. You can see it there in front of you. So, the Stewart Family Farm Walk, to 23rd of November 2019. Just a little bit of intro. Hello everybody, my name is Philip Stewart. So you may know me best farmer Phil, yada yada yada. We run a dairy calf to beef farm. We grow tillage to feed and finish our own cattle and we're also contractors do the pits, the bales, the slurry, the dung, the grain, etc. We farm around 180 hectares and have between 600 and 700 head of cattle at any one time in the farm. And the, the, all this handout is, is just on the dairy beef and the statistics that I've got from the past few years that we've been at dairy beef. So on the second page then, also just on the picture on the first page, the photo was taken by Shelley Corcoran. It's a lovely picture. It was taken, the Longford leader come out to do a little piece on us for their paper and that picture was taken and it's a picture that, it's just a fantastic picture, a picture that we absolutely adore. But anyways, we move on to the second page, so our 2016 analysis. So the 2016 analysis means all the calves that were bought in, or born in 2016 are in this as the results of them when they were put through the system out the other end. So you can see there, it's broken down into the breeds, which are highlighted in colour. So you have the Angus, Frisian, Jersey, Cross, Limousine, Frisian Cross, and Hereford Cross. And then the grand total at the bottom is the average across the board, across Everton. You have the breeds are then broken down into heifers. Then you have males, so that's the average between the bulls and the bullocks. And you have bullock and bull under that again. You have the numbers of the cattle in each breakdown. You have the average age. The average carcass weight, the min carcass and min carcass weight and max max carcass weight of the breakdowns, and you have the average grade and the average fat score. So that is what is there in front of you. I'm not going to run through it. You can pause it and have a look at it yourself if you want. It's very fairly self-explanatory after that. I suppose one thing I will mention. Some of you may be wondering why is there a limousine there? We we got rid of the last of the cows in the towards the middle and end of 2016 and we had the weanlings the calves that were born from the our suckler herd were in the system and we sold a, the majority of them in the mart but we decided to keep a few i think it was was there eight and put them through the system just to see how they did now one thing that i will point out as you may be able to see our weights for their ages weren't very good there's people getting under 16 months and getting far bigger weights. I think that has a lot to do with because of what happened to us in the past with TB. And the whole thinking was to just keep the herd there. So there was no sort of planning going into the breeding. It was just making sure that every heifer that was born went in calf to have a cow. To try and keep the herd number up while we went through the 8 year period of being locked up with TB. And having an awful time at that. But anyways. So that is that. So you can see there at the grand total at the bottom. So 2016's calves averaged 22.71 months of age. They averaged 258.67 kilos with a minimum weight of 204.8 and a maximum 343.5. And then the average of no equals 2 plus. That's what the average. So then we move on to the third page, which is 2017's analysis. So these are the calves that were born in 2017 and the breakdown of them when they were put through the system this year between then the last year and this year 2019 is when they were put through the system so it's the same again you have the you have it broken down into the different breeds 
it color coded so to speak and then you have the breakdown of the heifers male and then the bullock and bull across the board and uh, as you see there's no limousine on this but there is cemental which is we'll just i suppose we will just look at that because there was no cemental in the previous year i had nothing to compare it to so we'll just look at the averages of the cemental so with nine cementals divided between bulls and bullocks three bullocks six bulls average age was 24.3 months um average weight 330 kilos and an average grade of an r minus three minus key trade but anyways the grand total then of 2017's calves so the average age was 24 months average carcass weight 275 average grade of an o equals and an average fact score of a three minus so that's what we did in 17 so the fourth page is the comparison so looking at the differences between 16s and 17s so we start off at the top there we look at our angus we can see that our angus across the board so that's across all the different the, the different sexes were nine point roughly 9.3 kilos lighter on average than the previous year so 17s calves on average were lighter they had a lighter carcass weight than 16s however though the bulls 17s bulls averaged 12 kilos heavier than 16s so there was an increase in the uh, performance of the bulls but it was on the heifers and the bullocks where it fell down a bit so then there were also one month holder on average and the fat score was up from up to to a three plus so it went from a three minus to a three plus on average across the breed so we move below that then and we have our frisian so bulls on average were 37 kilos that little mark just in front that means roughly i like precise figures but my girlfriend says it looks nicer with the little symbols just to say it's roughly just so, so you're wondering so it's practically it's either 37 point something or it's 36.5 it's all rounded that's what pretty much all it means there's not 500 grams in it that's literally what that all that means but anyways apart from that so the bulls averaged 37 kilos heavier in 17 and 16 they were on average three months older which a lot of I'll explain later on some of the conclusion of that to the 16 assembly reports. So we'll just bang through these points. And then the Bulls fat scores are up 2 to a 2 plus. To an average of a 2 plus. It went from a 2 minus to a 2 plus. So then we look at our Jersey Bulls. Jersey Cross Bulls, sorry. So the Bulls averaged 4 kilos heavier in 17 and 16. And the Bulls fat scores went up 1. So it went from 2 equals to a 2 plus. And also there, I forgot to say... They averaged four kilos heavier at roughly the same age. There was, I think, a week, a week and a half in it. It was 0.2 or 0.3 months. So that's a week, week and a half. It was the difference in age. So then we move on to our Frisian Cross. So the Frisian Cross, our bulls were roughly 18 kilos heavier on average in 17 and 16. They were two months older on average. And the fat score went up to from a 2 minus to a 2 plus. So then on our Hereford, the bulls averaged 53 kilos heavier than the previous year. The bulls also were two months older on average than the previous year. And the bulls fat score went up one to a three minus on average. So you can see there when I was talking about the Frisian, Jersey, Frisian Cross and Hereford Cross, that was all just to do with the bulls, whereas the Angus, I looked across the breed. Jersey Cross, Her Frisian Cross and Hereford Cross there wasn't that many heifers and the difference was minimal so I, I made a point to point out heading that was substantially different than the previous year so then overall increase so this is the the grand total this is the average of 16 versus the average of 70 so the overall averages we've seen an increase of weight by 16.3 kilos across the board on average from 17 to 16 fat scores went up one so they went from a 2 plus in 16 to a 3 minus in 17 and the cattle were two months older on average so then in conclusion older cattle due to difficulty selling bulls in springtime due to bad trade so that is one of the reasons why our average age went up two months and particularly with the bulls we've seen a, a, a jump in the average age by a month two months three months that was primarily due to the sticky trade 
and being stuck with 70 overage bulls when the rug got taken under our feet, so to speak. But um, that's that's why that is. And just something on that note, one of the things that need, I suppose needs to be said, you've seen the average weight went up on all the cattle, but the average age also went up. When I broke down, divided the age or the weight, yeah, the age into the weight or the weight into the age, whatever way it is, I found that in 16 and 17, it was all very similar. There was bare, uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.1 of a kilo in the difference per month per animal on the average weights and average ages. So it was very little, with the exception of the jersey, which averaged, I think it was either 0.5 or 0.7, which was the highest difference that 17's jersey calves, jersey cross calves, did 0.5 to 0.7 a kilo more or yeah 0.7 to 0.5 to 0.7 a kilo more than the previous year per month so that was the only substantial difference that i seen when i broke back down the weight into the age just on that note then fat scores increased due to the feeding of biscuit meal so that was something we seen in 16 we didn't feed any biscuit meal all our frisian jersey cross frisian cross bulls were all rough averaging two minus in 17's calves We've had them biscuit meal for the first time and we've seen our fat scores jump up from an average of a 2 minus across the bulls to a 2 plus, which is bang on the mark. That's what you need to be getting when you're dealing with bulls. And the only difference in the feeding was the biscuit meal. So it does go to show keeping the records and relating that to what we're doing on farm. It shows the benefit of certain products and different routines and that to be able to make better decisions but anyways we'll talk a bit more about the benefits of this at the end of the video just to try and bang through this so we move on then to page five which is a comparison of performance of stock bull versus ai cattle from 2016's calves so this is on the angus calves that we bought in we had one farm that uses a fantastic stock bull the best of the best a lovely big beefy stock bull a bull you'd be proud to put on your suckler cows like for dairy man to use a bull of this standard is exceptional so to so to speak now but anyways and we also looked at the rest of our farms which were all using easy well presumably using i'm not over sure what the sires were but presumably using the short gestation easy calving angus sires on their cows so we can see there uh, the table is broken down at the stock bull. So it's across heifers and bulls, no bullocks that year. And then the average between the two, so the average age, average carcass weight, the average grades and the average fat scores. And the same is done again with the AI. If you want, pause it and have a look there for yourself and you can see for yourself the differences. But then at the bottom of the page, you can see in the box, the bullet points. In 2016, the stock bull, we finished the stock bull's calves one month earlier than the AI bred calves, we averaged 53 euro and 32 cent ahead more than we did the AI calves, and they averaged 15.34 kilos more than the AI calves. So, and then I that was 16. So when I had 17 calves or calves put through the system, I said I'd do the same and I'd look at them and see was there any difference, and it was pretty much bang on the money the same again in 17s. Stock bull bred Angus calves finished one month earlier than the AI equivalents, 56 euro and 73 cents more than the AI equivalents, and 11 ki 11.88 kilos more on average than the AI calves. Now, one of the things I think, the, the, as the weight may have went down, but the money went up, I think um, I, I was, didn't include it. Uh, stock bulls were grading slightly better than the AI calves. In 17, whereas in 16, you can see there, they were pretty much the exact same. But in 17, that little difference made the price go up, even though the weight went down. And that just goes to show the difference in quality. When you're buying good quality stock bull bred Angus calves, you do get on better than your AI bred calves. But I suppose one of the points to make out of them calves, we were paying that 50 euro extra for... The stock bull bred calves versus the AI calves. And as you can see there in paying 50 euro more. You're pretty much left. That both animals are leaving you the same amount of money. And something in my view. Looking at this and going forward. That to make it worthwhile to pay more for the better animal. 
you don't want to be given any more than half of what you expect to get so if I'm saying there that I expect a stock bull bred Angus calf to do 50 euro better than an AI equivalent in my mind I would expect that I shouldn't have to pay more than 25 euro extra for the stock bull calf versus the AI to make it worth my while to spend a little bit extra to spend the extra money on the better animal because as everyone does know if you're going to spend more on your animals that ties up more money and all of them things and to make it worthwhile for yourself there needs to be a difference so you can let me know in the comments down below what you think i know there's some dairy men watch me and they might say well they want the most of that but look whatever you think please hit me down in the comments down below i'm interested to hear what people think in my mind it should be no more than half of the expected uh expect the potential value of the animal in my mind but anyways we'll stop babbling on about that and move on to page six so page six is all to do with our 2019 calves that were reared on the feeders there's a lot of tables and there's a lot of information there and it does look a bit daunting but we'll, i'll try and break it down as best as i can so you can understand so we'll re so just in the first bullet box there you can see sick one sick two etc is the number of times a calf presented with an illness so you can see in the tables on all the tables there there's sick one two three four plus so that's what that accounts for so sick one is a calf that got sick and i had to treat whether it was pneumonia bloat chill twisted gut something that i said right that calf is sick and i have to go do something to help that calf and that but the percentage is the percentage of the cow the number the the percentage there is of the percentage of the number of calves on the top so you can see there feeder one the amount we reared 184 calves on feeder one and the 39.6 percent of them 184 calves got sick once and then only 16 percent of that 184 calves got sick a second time and so forth and so on across all the tables there just as an example so you can see there there is a huge difference between feeder one and feeder two's mortality rate the number of deaths 27 to 7 and 14.6 percent to 4.2 percent which left us with a total mortality rate of 9.7 which is high there's no two ways about it the biggest problem on our farm at the minute is the mortality rate in the calves it's bad it's been a lot worse than what it is now to what we have it at now we are happy that we're getting it down we've reduced it by an awful lot compared to what it was a couple of years ago and going forward that's our biggest problem we have to overcome is to keep chipping away at that and trying to get it down under 10 percent and down even further down to five percent we are at the minute we're over 10 percent with the loss of calves a few calves during the summer to little things and we had a bit of trouble at the back end when we housed the first batch of calves we had a, bit, a good bit of trouble with pneumonia but we're over that now but it has pushed us over the 10 percent mark but it is going forward it's the biggest area of improvement on our farm is our mortality rate so anyways one of the reasons why so i suppose one of the things i will say first just on feeder one there's 184 calves reared and feeder two 164 a total of 347 all them calves were not on the feeders at the one time feeder one we filled that first we filled it to 150 calves we filled feeder two then we started rearing calves on buckets then we had calves coming off feeder one so we restocked feeder one and that's where the extra calves got onto feeder one we reared about 60 calves above and beyond what was reared on the feeders on buckets and one of the reasons why the number of deaths and the mortality rate in feeder one was so high because all of one of the farms we buy off we buy off 10 different farms it's highlighted in red below farm F all his calves were on that feeder and we had a very high mortality rate off that farm so then i just have said it on the side in the next bullet box bullet point box increased deaths on feeder one likely due to all farm f's calves using this feeder and their increased subception to pneumonia which is what they mainly died of so below that then we have the sickness and deaths across the breeds so if we break down the numbers of the different breeds so we have angus Frisian, Frisian Cross, Jersey Cross, Hereford Cross, and we also had four Ayrshires. And because the number of Ayrshires is four, as you can see, one calf got sick, 25%. So one thing that needs to be taken into consideration when looking at some of the statistics, some of the numbers, when 
their sample group is small it's not a great representative of that animal or for that thing it's actually something I should have said at the start of the video these are the statistics of my farm they're not the same they're not going to be the same as every other farm um, and just don't take them as gospel take them with a, bit, bit, a pinch of salt they're not representative of the whole across Everton this is just the statistics of our farm but anyways so some of the most interesting things that I found at looking at this um, table was our Jersey Cross had the lowest rate of sickness at 24% followed by Angus at 27 and then our Frisian and Frisian Cross were way up at 46% and the Frisian same again all of Farm F's calves were Frisian calves and that likely contributed to why the mortality rate of the Frisian and the Frisian sickness is up so high and I said it there again on the next bullet point all of Farm F's deaths were Frisian therefore higher death percentage for Frisian than other breeds and Jersey Cross have the lowest sickness rate or rate of sickness so that's why I took away from the second table so then we move down to sickness and milk used on the farm so we buy off 10 different dairy farms now the milk used I had that included but there was virtually no difference it was only I don't think there was any difference more than five liters between one to the next across any of it so we decided to just take it out just to try and simplify the tables a bit more and leave it easier for people to understand but anyways so we move on we have our 10 different farms broken down there the numbers of cows bought off the amount that died and same again the percentage the percentage mortality rate and then the sickness rates you can see farm f which is by far the, a very high mortality rate its sickness rate is very high and um so yeah what other things to take in consideration when looking at the farm some of the numbers of cows bought off some of the farms is quite small you can see there's two farms that are over 10 percent but both farms have less than 20 calves come off them so that all of a sudden bangs them over 10 percent even though you could have maybe one loss of pneumonia and another one lost to pure flu just twisted gut nothing you can do about it so as i said before a pinch of salt has to be taken with some of the num when you're looking at numbers and then percentages afterwards a little bit of pinch of salt when you're dealing with smaller numbers it has to be taken into perspectives but definitely farm f is a farm we're having trouble with and we will have to go to that that farm farmer and say look at we have a problem with these calves the biggest the biggest um we know what the problem is pneumonia is the problem and we have to tell the farmer and chat with the farmer and see can he do anything to improve the the quality of the calves and the, try and see whether we get the farmer to vaccinate the calves before they come to us whether we see is there something the farmer could give them to give them a little give them a little bit of a boost because realistically going forward when you have a farm like that you can't really afford to keep them on when they're causing so much trouble but I suppose one thing I should highlight and I said on the farm walk of them 10 them 10 farms we work for them 10 farms we do slurry we do silage for some of them we do a lot of work and farm f is actually one of our biggest contracting customers so you get caught in a catch 22 you don't want to fall out with them but the calves at the other end of it aren't just what we want them to be so as me Chagas advisor says you need to make the best economic decision possible so that's about all i say saying that and just on something else one of the i think it's farm which farm is it? i think it's farm d dash historically that farm we had a lot of trouble with calves with susception to pneumonia and mortality rate it was a problem we told we told the farmer look there's a problem here we need to do something that we can we can't afford to keep buying your calves and the farmer said right he took it on board and he started giving his calves I can't I think it was a yogurt or some kind of supplement that he gave them within 24 hours of birth after they got their colostrum their three or four layers of colostrum he gave them this bolus and as you can see there three percent mortality rate one calf lost and his calves have done fantastically well this year compared to other years you you just wouldn't know they were his calves to have done that well this year and that was purely because we 
sat down, we told the farmer, look, there's a problem, we need it solved or we won't take your calves. And because the farmer does not want to be going to the mart, and with everyone knows what's coming down the road when it comes to the calf situation in the spring, the farmers are more than willing to work with you when it comes to finding a good home for them so they don't have to be worrying about what they're going to do with them. And going forward, that is going to be our biggest bargaining chip for anyone that's at the dairy beef. It's our biggest bargaining chip. is dealing with farmers that just want to get a good home for their calves and you will be able to influence them to what you need and want because they need they need to have a good home for them calves to go to. But anyways, I'll stop talking about that. We'll move on to the next. The cause of death. So you can see by far, 58% of our mortalities were caused by pneumonia. It's by far our biggest tr problem. It's something that we have to continue to tighten and tighten down on. We run a vaccination program this year gone by. It worked very well for us, but we let the ball slip and we might not have done it just as stringent as I would like to, but because my, gir I have, my girlfriend is in Ireland now and she's more than willing, she's probably listening to me now and going, what the fuck is he on about now? But because I have an extra set of hands in the evenings and that, my plan going forward, whereas we used to vaccinate them in a big batch, the plan going forward when it comes to the vaccination program is the calf comes into the farm he goes into his training pen, you give him a day or two, then vaccinate him. And then you let him out and you record him when he's trained and then you go back and hit him three weeks later. The biggest problem, the strain of pneumonia, we have the problem with his pasture and pneumonia. We've been lab tested, I don't know how many, countless numbers of calves and every time it comes back, the one strain. And just on, I for, forgot to mention the point, um, but we don't vaccinate the calves when we let them out of the trailer when we're after getting them. The reason for that is we were told by a vet um, that the stress of the transport of the calf, the calf releases antibodies, or has act, uh, it releases a, a large amount of antibodies and it can make the vaccine less effective. So you get, want to give the calf some time, a day, maybe two, to calm down, just to settle in, and then hit him with the vaccine to get the most effectiveness out of, uh, out of it. So... Then, just on the bottom there, the very last one, um, the put back on feeder. So, you can see there the number of calves. So, what I mean by put back on feeder, they were calves, when the calves started coming to the end of the grow or the feed curve, and they were starting to hit the wind down phase, I went through every calf, I had a me book right out, and I wrote every number, and I made sure I seen every calf, and I evaluated that calf just by his physical appearance, was he full of himself, was he looking good and then I made the decision then whether that calf was good to continue on the feed curve to come off milk or whether that calf needs more milk and needs to go back a couple of days back onto the feed curve to continue on a larger amount of milk to try and get him over whatever little hiccup he had and you, all I did was I just counted so the number of calves there there's 72 in total that the percentage wise that was 20% of the calves had to be kept back on the feeder at an average of 8.9 days was all I'd put them back just to give them the extra supplement to get them over whatever was wrong with them and get them off. And oh, there was something I think I was to say when I was on the calves, but I don't, I can't remember. I might come back to that if I can't, if I can't remember, but if I remember. Anyway, we move on to page 7, which is the genetic evaluation. This is where we start getting real technical and into our percentages and, and re this is this is the bit that I find the most interesting. But anyways on the genetic evaluation I looked at our Frisian bulls. So these so the Frisian bulls I looked at our Frisian bulls I brought I looked at their percentages. When I do up my database I used ICBF website to get the breakdown of what is in them. So how much Holstein is in them or Frisian is in them or Jersey or is there any cement and there's some of them cattle we have there was cement in the Norwegian Red, Ayrshire, and to break all that stuff down to see is there any correlations that I can find that shows that a certain percentage is equal better calves. Really intrigued, that's all it was. But anyways, so we looked at our 100% Holstein. It's broken down into tables. You can see number of, so there's 10. Average carcass weight, 315.2 kilos. Average age, 25. High, 
as I've said before, average ages were all high due to the bad sticky trade in the spring of this year. Also, just I forgot to mention, all the genetic evaluations and the next page where we look at our dairy sires was all off 27 Dean's calves. But anyways, so our grade was an O minus fat scores, average 2 plus. It's the same then across the board. So we look at our Holstein, 97 to 75%. So because it's Frisian, the Holstein makes up 97 to 75%. And then the other percentage, so 3 to 25%, is made up of F4, which... In my mind, and I'm pretty sure I'm right in saying it, that means British Frisian. So the statistics of them are there, the number, average carcass weights, age, grades, and fat scores. Then we look at her Holstein, 74 to 50%. And then same again, number, age, weights, grades, fat scores. So then the bullet box below, just to break it down, to make it easy reading for people, the greater the percentage Holstein, the greater the weight but the grade goes do, goes does go down so as you can see there our 100 percent holstein is the heaviest bull then the 97 to 75 and then the 74 to 50 percent so you can see the more holstein the more weight but as it says in the point that our 100 percent holstein averaged no minus whereas the other holsteins measure the measure the Averaged on all equals. And then there is a bit of a discrepancy in the age there. I suppose it. I can't not count it as a means. As you can see there is. So the there is a bit of a discrepancy in the, in the age there when it comes to the weights. Um, again as I said before when I break down the weights into the ages. I find that there is little to no difference when when you break it down when you divvy up ages into weights but that is something to take into consideration when looking at it but then the other end of it there <coughs> on a there was roughly 30 euro on average between the 100 percent holstein and the lowest percentage so we got 30 euro more in the factory for 100 percent holsteins than we did our 74 to 50 percent holsteins that's all down to weight, pretty much. And and because of it was an O minus, that would have dipped the amount of money we got. But look at that's that's that. So then we move on to our Angus. So this is across bulls, bullocks and heifers. And we see we have it's broken down into Holstein and then at the last table is Jersey. So our Angus we have our fifty to forty percent Holstein. So that's what makes up the other half of the Angus cross. And then we have our 38 to 13 percent Holstein, and then we have our Jersey 38 to 25 percent Jersey. It was all just to look at, at the comparison, so it's the same again, it's broken down in a number of average carcass weights, age, grades, and fat. And the table down below the greater the percentage Holstein, the greater the weight, a grade up of a fat score down. So, something that I've seen across so far with the genetic evaluations. The more Holstein is in the animal, the more weight we seem to be getting. In in that there, you can see there isn't much of a discrepancy. There's 0.4, so less than two weeks in the difference between the 50 to 40 and the 38 to 13 percent. But there's just under a 30 kilo gap, so there isn't the same kind of a discrepancy as with the Frisians. Then also something to take into the account. The Jersey is better than the lower 38 to 13 percent Holstein. So on average, the Jersey, the the Angus Jersey cross averaged 258.7 kilos, whereas the Angus Holstein 38 to 13 percent Holstein averaged only 247. And there was nearly a full month in the differences. The Jerseys were finished a month earlier, nearly a month earlier on average, than the 38 to 13 percent Holsteins. Which was quite interesting to see. Something I wasn't actually expecting to see. I would have assumed the jersey would have been a little bit lesser than that. But that's the statistics. That's what has shown. And then to finish the last bullet point. The higher the percentage Holstein. The higher percentage Holstein. Is roughly 70 euro above the lower percentage. And 24 euro above the jersey. So what that means is we got 70 euro more. For the 50 to 40% Holstein Angus 
Now we did the 38 to 13 percent Holstein Angus, and we got 24 euro more for our 50 to 40 percent Holstein Angus than our Jersey Cross Angus, our Ang Angus Cross Jersey, Jersey, whatever way you want to look at it. But that's what that means. So move on to our last but not least page, the Dairy Sires. This is this is probably my favourite page. That's where I put in a good bit of work and I was quite happy with how it came out. But anyways, first bullet point, there was a total of 58 sires used across 2017's calves. I, the top three used are as followed and an example of a high DBI Angus bull. So, as it says, of all 17's calves we had 58 sires registered on ICBF to them. So we looked at the top three most used sires on the calves and then our high DBI Angus. So we have WLY, LWR, HCB, they're the dairy sires, the most used dairy sires. And then we had KYA was our example high DBI Angus. So you can see there are the bullet points underneath each sire. You have your DBI score, you have their breakdown of their percent of their genetic makeup. You have the number of herds they were used on, number of cattle that were sired to them, their average carcass weights, average age, average grade, average fat. So you can see WLY DBI score of minus 13, LWR had a score of minus 5, HZB had a score of plus 7, KYA had a, which is the Angus Bull, had a plus 84 score. And then you can see then the breakdown WLY was 62.5% Holstein to 37.5% Frisian. LWR was 75% Holstein to 25% Frisian. HCB was 100% Holstein. And KYA then was 100% Angus, obviously. And it's broken down then the same going down. So as we move on down to the bullet points at the bottom. So HCB is the best sire of the four, achieving the highest average price, which was roughly €170. Euro above the worst which is KYA so we got 170 euro more for HCB's calves than we did the calves side by KYA now something I didn't point out there but it needs to be taken into consideration KYA was only used KYA only sired three calves the high of records for there was calves that we got when I looked them up on ICBF I had no genetic information I had no breakdowns of percentages and I had no registered dairy sire that I could find on them it just says animals not on the website so whatever that's about I don't know but that's just to take into consideration it was on three but something else to take into consideration one the same herd used both HCB and KYA and I looked up the genetic makeup of the, um, I looked up the genetic makeup of the bulls that were... Now, these are all bulls that I used on this. No bullocks, no heifers. These are bulls, both on KY and HCB, on LWR and WLY, just if I didn't make that clear already. But anyways, so one, one herd used both HCB and KYA, and I looked up the genetic makeup of them calves and... They were practically identi identical to each other. One was 36% Holstein, the other was 36% Holstein on HCB versus KYA, and the same on the, the few that was used. So it was similar cows. I was pointing out on the farm walk that different cows, different calves, but in this instance, looking at the genetic information that I have, I can see that it's practically the same regardless of the sire so we'll move on to the second bullet point the second highest average price which belongs to LWR is 128 euro behind HCB so LWR was the next highest um, next highest next highest total price achieving animal but it was still 128 euro behind HCB and just on that, HCB averaged 322 kilos, which is a fantastic weight. But the average age was just over 24 months. It was 24 months and 2 weeks. And that, as I've said before, was down to bulls going over age. And the sticky trade. Whereas LWR 
averaged a weight of 284 kilos 0.3 at just under 24 months so there was very little difference in them but there was a gap of 38 kilos that was the difference so there was 38 kilos in the difference over the space of just two weeks really realistically that's that's there was 38 kilos between them so it just goes to show it's the same then with WLY he was that little bit behind on them then after that with an average age then of 24 months so the age on them bulls was fairly similar there was very little difference in them so the final bullet point and the higher the percentage holds then the greater the weight which is also correlated with achieving a greater average price it's something that we've seen before in the previous genetic evaluation the more Holstein is in them the better the weight and that always seems to be tied to how much we get the grade doesn't seem to make that big of an impact because we're talking about all grade cattle they rarely ever fall outside of that the price increase on the grades isn't enough to justify a loss in weight I know people say and I've, I've actually heard quite a few people mention it they're talking about how their dairy cows are very British British Friesian they're very you know good shape good confirmation but the confirmation the up the up upgrade now the confirmation doesn't seem to outweigh getting the higher weights which is always tied to having a better price at the end of the day but I suppose the one thing that needs to be said about that when you're trying to sell cattle particularly when things are sticky if you have a shed full of seven foot high one foot wide Frisian bulls, 100% horse and Frisian bulls, you know what the factory is going to say to you. It's going, they're going to be hard sold, even though you'll probably end up with the most money. And just some, something on that point, the best animal we've ever had was one of them, seven foot high, a foot wide. We call him the racehorse. He was that tall, he put, he put his head across the barrier and scratched his neck. He was a huge height. He was 27 months old when we sent him to the factory he came into 419 kilos and he came into I think it was five euros short of 1500 he was the best animal we've ever had he went over age just because we couldn't get a pick of flesh on him he, he graded I think it was a P plus two minus but this wasn't this year this was he was last year and we got a better price for him and that was probably the reason but the weight weight is what you get paid on at the end of the day Anyways, that is the end of the handout. I hope you found it interesting. I know this video is quite long. It's at 44 minutes. I don't think I have much to take out of that. So what you're looking at now is just the drone flying around at the, on the end of the farm walk. I forgot to include it in the video of the farm walk. I edited that while I was in the airport on my way to England for a party. And I forgot to transfer the video off my computer onto the laptop so I would be able to do that so I said I include it in the back of this but anyways that is the statistics of the farm whether you think they're good bad or indifferent that's what they are hope you found it interesting hope you might find something to take away from it and just on two points that I want to say so I'm thinking of creating a whatsapp group for people interested in going into dairy beef or people already in dairy beef regardless of where you're from so it's open to people from Ireland or the UK or France Germany anywhere in the world really I can't imagine I get too too many people asking about it outside of Ireland and the UK or even just outside Ireland for that instance but I've had a lot of people have asked me since the farm walk for the handout and for more information and my thoughts on this that and other and a group so if anyone is interested in joining now it is something I'm, I'm test it's not something I'm going to do I'm going to test the wire see do I get many people respond to me so in my in the description down below you will find a business email farmerphil135 at gmail.com if you send an email to that address and uh, just your name what county you're from or where you're from and what you're doing whether you're thinking again into dairy beef or whether you're already in, ready in and the reason I'm doing it this way is just it's for the use of a better word a bit of a vetting process to sort the boys from the men so that I can try and make sure that it's just people that are genuinely interested 
that if I do get enough interest and start the WhatsApp group so that we can all communicate with each other and we can share ideas, share experiences, share mistakes so we can improve ourselves and each other. That's the real reason for it because when we got into dairy beef four years ago or five years ago now, I can't remember having anyone that I could ask a question. There was very few, there wasn't that many people at it and I don't, I, I can't, I can't, honestly I can't remember anyone that we could go to if we had a problem that was in the same boat and might have been able to help us. So I think going forward, from my experience with being part of different groups and the grassland group and doing the Young Beef Farmer Sustainability Programme all that, it's been this help to me in improving the farm is by hearing what other people have done and hearing what works and what doesn't work and all of the rest. I think it's something that, particularly for lads getting into it, it'd be of a huge help to them. So look, if you're interested, hit me down and uh, head into the description down below for the email address. Send me an email and if there's enough interest, I will be doing it. Also, something else, you've seen all that handout that was done off my database and I suppose by saying it's my database, I better say it's my girlfriend's too, Liv, because she has experience from working on with a, a pig company in the UK where she did placement while she was in college um, and she, she worked a lot on stats and with Excel spreadsheets doing stuff with pigs, ventilation and all of that kind of crap. And we have a database which is on Excel spreadsheet, we have it all formulated and that. And I put in all, I put in all the raw data, so all the genetic percentages and all the farms that come off. Literally everything I can think of I put in that I can do, that do with that, individual animals I put in. And then my girlfriend with her experience, she's able to formulate up graphs and averages and be able to take all that stuff that's in that handout out of all the raw data. And if anyone is interested in getting a copy of the spreadsheet, I can send it to you. Or if you're interested maybe in having um, a similar kind of a thing done on your own farm, on your own cattle. If you're, look, it's just I'm throwing out in the water. If anyone is interested in <coughs> getting a similar kind of a handout done on them, same again, hit me in that business email down below and we can talk about about it and see is it something that you're interested in. It's just some sort of a little business side venture I suppose would be the right way to put it. Um doing it for people to try and generate a bit of a, a, another bit of an income. But that is it. I don't think there is anything else to talk about. I think I've it all said and done. This video has actually turned out to be quite a long one. But I don't think there's anything else. No, I don't think there's anything else. I suppose just on the drones, um, if you're thinking of getting yourself a drone or getting a loved one a drone, head over to DroneWorksIreland.ie. They've done me a great deal on my drone, and if you're thinking of get buying someone a drone, well worth going over to them lads and having a look at what they have. 12 month warranty and all second hand drones. Look, you couldn't ask for better. DGI specialists. Um, so yeah, give them an old plug, because they did, they did, they did, honestly, they did a great deal with, for me with, when I got my drone and just couldn't have asked for better. Um, no, I think that's it. So, that's it from me. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope I kept it interesting. I know it is a bit of a long one, but sure, look it. I explained all I could explain about the handout. It's, I suppose it's nearly a, it's a bit like the farm walking itself. But anyways, so... Caps, beanies, I'm restocking beanies now so you know where to get them. My Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, all of that. Literally everything else that I might have said or you think you might want to know is in the description down below. I put as much as I can into there. So head down there and you should see whatever you want. And if you, there's something there you don't see that you want to know, hit me in the comments down below. And as always, I hope you enjoyed this video. That is it for me. Please like and subscribe to my channel. Leave a comment down below if you have any questions or anything like that. That is it for me. Good luck. Oh.